Yes, sir. Done, sir. Uh, good morning to one and all present in the session. Uh, welcome back to the fourth day of the session. So today in the session, we have with us uh, Professor Subhash Chandra Mukhopadhyay. Sir will be uh, presenting you uh, the process of uh, taking the data and going up to the computational aspects uh, with respect to the census, as well as the various case studies uh, in the IoT themes of applications. So let me just brief you about uh, Professor Subhash Chandra Mukhopadhyay. Uh, Professor Subhash holds a, a BE gold medalist and ME PhD uh, from India and Doctor of Engineering from Japan. He has over 30 plus years of teaching uh, industrial and research experience. Currently, he is working as a professor of mechanical uh, and electronics engineering, Macquarie University, Australia. And he is a discipline leader of the mechatronics engineering degree program. He is also the director of international engagement at the Maca uh, Macquarie University. Uh, Australia. His fields of interest include smart sensors and sensing technology, instrumentation uh, techniques, wireless sensors and network, Internet of Things, and etc. He has supervised over 40 postgraduate uh, post students and over 100 honor students. He has examined over 60 plus postgraduate theses. He has published over 450 papers in different international journals and conference proceedings written six books and 40 book chapters and edited 18 conference proceedings. He has also edited 35 books with Springer Verlag and 30 journal special issues. He has organized over 20 international conferences as either general chairs or co-chairs or technical program committee member as a chair. He has delivered 366 presentations, including keynote, invited tutorial and special lectures. Sir is a fellow of IEEE, USA and a fellow of IET UK and a fellow of IET India. And he is a topical editor of IEEE Sensor Journals and associate editor of IEEE Transactions on Instrumentation and Measurements and an associate editor of IEEE Systems Journal. He is a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Census Council from 2017 to 2022. Uh, he is the founding chair, the IEEE Census Council, uh, New South Wales chapter, Australia and he is the Editor-in-Chief of the Smart Sensing and Intelligent Systems Journal. So more uh, information, you can browse it from the uh, Google Scholar. So may I now request uh, Professor Subhash Chandra Mukhopadhyay, who is my guru. I am the student of uh, Professor Subhash Chandra Mukhopadhyay. Uh, I have learned a lot from the sir. So uh, I hope you are also going to learn a lot of things in this present uh, session for today's uh, program. Yeah. Thank you. So may I request uh, Professor Subhash to take over the session, please. Okay, so thank you very much, Nagender. Yeah, Nagender, you told that you have learned a lot of things, but you have spent three and a half years with me. So it's one hour, I won't be able to give everything. So good morning, everyone. I am sure that most of you are in India. So it's 10 o'clock there, just over 10. So it's uh, 3.30 in Sydney. So this one is the, is the nice thing that Nagender has uh, you know, organized this workshop and uh, via Zoom, uh, this has given us the facility to share. So I'm based in Sydney and it's not difficult now to deliver this type of lectures over Zoom. So I'll be sharing some of the research activities which we have started many, many years back and continuing different things. As one of our very best student, Nagender has uh, done work on smart home and you have already listened from him. So similar things we are working and I will be sharing some of the activities today. So my university is called Macquarie University. So this is one of the five universities in Sydney. It's not very old university, it's established in 1964. It's the government university. In, in, in Australia, except one university, most of the university are actually government university. The ranking of the university is last year, QS ranking has become better than 200, they're on 196. We have almost 40,000 students, but of course, as you know that Due to COVID-19, the international student has been impacted heavily. So in this year, the number of students has become quite low in international students. 
our university is quite famous as you have, you have seen the picture here uh, our professors in late 90s were involved with the development and invention of wi-fi and that's a our university is very much proud of that invention and also it brings quite a lot of money as royalty I am delivering this talk as a part of the ITBLE Distinguished Lecturers Program. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about the ITBLE Sensor Council. Many of you know ITBLE Sensor Council is very similar like any ITBLE society, but it has the support. It's not a society as such. So it has the support of 26 different societies of ITBLE. So whether it's the Instrument Measurement Society, whether it's say engineering, medicine, biological society or power electronic society. So they have the support on sensor council. And the reason is that as we all know that sensors is fundamental. So many societies they also involve with sensor related activities. So that's why they have their support. So that's the website of the ITBLE sensor council. And if you see the website, this is one of the picture you get. So that's basically the executive committee members of the council. In terms of the council activities, they publish quite a few publications. The main one is the ITBLE Sensor Journal. The impact factor is just over three, but it's growing. Also, they have ITBLE Sensor Letters, and they are involved with many other publications. One of the important publication is ITBLE Internet of Things Journal. The impact factor is over nine. So it's, a, it's doing very, very well. This is the growth of the ITBLE Sensor Journal, as you can see. Number of article usage. So that's the article download, which is growing almost exponentially. And also the ranking is improving. So it started with 105 in 2002, and now it's 16th among the ITBLE publications. In terms of the conference organized by the ITBLE Sensor Council, the main conference, which is the flagship conference, is ITBLE Sensor Conference, which is happened annually. And also they organize few other conference. One of the conference called FLEPS, which started recently, happening in Manchester and also in Arsia. But ITBLE Sensor Conference this year, as you can see in Sydney, October 31st to November 3, I am organizing that conference, but we don't know yet. So this is the ITBLE Sensor 2020 happened in Netherlands last year. So ITBLE Sensor 2021 happen, will happen in Sydney. We still don't know whether it will happen face to face or it will happen via Zoom. It all depends how the vaccine for COVID-19, how it, how effective it will be. And then of course, whether Australia will open the border for international travel without quarantine. So that's the call for papers for the ITBLE sensor conference. Anyone can actually search in the Google and you will get it details. Important thing is that June, 20, June 18th is the paper deadline. So if anyone does research on sensors or internet of things, enable sensors or in similar area, uh, that's the opportunity to submit the paper. So the paper is short paper, three pages plus one page for reference. So it's not a very long paper like the normal regular paper. So ITBLE Sensor Council, <clears throat> I am one of the distinguished lecturer. Whole idea of this is to share research activities among the fellow colleagues so that everyone is getting benefited from this. So the whole idea of this that you can actually request any distinguished lecturer. There are 10 distinguished lecturer at the moment with ITBLE Sensor Council. You get the details in the website and if you want to organize any kind of distinguished lecture seminar, you can request the distinguished lecturer. These days, there is no need of travel. 
so it's not a difficult things only problem is the adjusting the time and everybody will be happy to deliver a talk okay so with that background now i'll go to the research activities our group we basically do research on sensor related activities we develop different types of sensor whether sensor can be used for healthcare applications or environmental monitoring or even industrial application and we try to make the sensors connected to internet of things that means the cloud so that the data will be available to cloud and anyone can access being located in remote places now sensor is very important if we want to measure something we like to know what is the actual value so the error in the sensor is very very important also we want to improve our lifestyle the environment which where we live and in order to improve that we need to know what is the current value and sensor provides that value so effectively without sensors our life will be stand still and that's the important of the sensor area and that's why you have seen that many itbli societies they support the sensor council because sensors are fundamental element while we look at sensors we come across different term sensors transducers actuators transmitters stimulus and they are very important in the sensor network wireless sensor network or internet of things in my laboratory we do research in two different ways if somebody is doing masters which is a short term program spanning between 9 months to 1 year we usually try to make system sensing system using the readily available sensors so the left hand side what you see are the sensors available in the market so important thing here is to selection of the sensors which will be decided by many parameters cost one of the important thing and of course the availability and the performance figures you develop the smart interfacing circuit and connect to the wireless transceiver and so the put data can be uploaded into cloud in the right hand side you see the fabricated sensors in our lab so if somebody wants to do phd which is a time quite 3 years to 3 and 1/2 years program you can actually look into making new sensors so that's what we do but doesn't mean that everybody needs to work on the sensors i have got 12 phd students at the moment not everybody working on sensors five students working on sensors and many other working on electrical engineering different aspect when we talk about internet of things many of you are attending this workshop from last 3 days i know nagender has de delivered some lectures and you know the basics these are the four basic building block for making anything as internet of things enable system the fundamental one of course the sensor iot will not exist without sensor sensors are the most important element because you want to know what is going on and that comes from the sensor but sensors the raw data may not be meaningful unless we process them so the processor especially the embedded processor is the second element for that and then we need to upload the data into cloud so internet connectivity is the another important requirement i don't say important i say must if somebody wants to do iot you need to have internet because you are accessing the cloud so internet connectivity is the fundamental requirement for that and of course when you 
think of uploading the data in the cloud and the data is available to everyone, then security becoming very important. We do not really do research on security. We also do not do really research on internet connectivity. In terms of the IoT protocol, we use the existing protocol, but our research is on sensor. But these are the main four build, basic building blocks for making a IoT system. So today's seminar, I will be giving you some of the research what we are doing. The big picture of one of our research is called smart home. Actually, Nagender has done extensive research on that domain during 2012 to 2015, 2013 to 2015, that during that time in New Zealand at Massey University, my earlier university in New Zealand. The whole idea of this research, smart home, is to provide an environment which is safe, sound, and secure, and also it can be for independent living. In the beginning, when we started the research, it was primarily for elder care, for elderly people, but later on, we realized that it is not only for elderly, anyone who wants to live independently, this technology can be very, very useful. So why smart home? As we all know that people now live longer than before. This is due to the advancements of science, different types of medicines, good food, and also human being become more health conscious. So that's why life expectancy has increased compared to 20, 30 years back. But unfortunately, at the age of 65, 78 and above, human being are not only forced, but also the general rule in the society get retired and they become fragile. And they are prone to different types of incidents. So they need some help and that's why an accident can happen. But it's not only for the elderly people. If you see the picture here, this person's relatively young in his 40s, is to live alone and something happened, we don't know, but he has died in his home. Of course, everyone will die at certain stage of their life, but what is very unfortunate is that the dead body was discovered after three weeks. So that's the one of the danger if somebody alone living at home, if something happens, there is no one to help. And that's why the usefulness of technology come there. If we have technology, the smart home we are talking about, the system can help at the time of dire needs. So if you see the statistic, almost 35% people, both men and women category, are now living alone. So it's not elderly, it's anyone from 16 to 60 years because they either study or they either work, not living in the same city. They travel maybe during the weekdays or even during the weekend and living alone during the weekdays for, the, for work. So those type of situation. So what do we do? If we have smart sensors and technology, and we can monitor the activities of the persons, what the person is doing, and those activities are checked as regular activity or not, then we can actually tell about the person's 24 seven different activities, and that can tell us whether the person is living a regular lifestyle. If not, then we can send some text message, which will be going to any caregiver or maybe son or daughter or maybe near relative, and they will be checking what is going wrong. 
So that's the idea of this whole smart home. So you need lots of sensors. Sensor can monitor different appliances which are used for the person's life. Whether it's a bed or whether it's a water usage or whether it's a you know, televisions, whether it's the, any other thing, that will be decided by the person's lifestyle. So during Nagender's PhD, as well as we have few more students, we have developed different systems. Some of the systems we have used our own sensor and some of the systems we use sensors readily available making at a system. These sensors are all wireless sensors. And as you can see, XB, Zigbee, that time was very popular. Now it's not that popular. There are different other things are coming, but when we used to do research quite some time back, that time Zigbee was very, very popular for these applications. So wirelessly you transmit the measured data. Data is received by the coordinator, which is basically your data storage and data processing. And it checks on real time whether everything is fine, everything is normal, everything is regular. If not, then some action is taken. So we had a old house built in 1938, two bedroom house, and we used different sensors at different places in the house and we monitor the activities. Of course, in this domain, one of the important thing is that if the person is willing to have wearable sensors. So wearable sensors based monitoring also very, very popular in many places. One of the important thing here to note that people do not like to have any sensors on their body for 24 seven. If you have someone who likes to have the sensors on his body, on her body 24 seven, then of course his system will be very easy to make because that will give the physiological parameters which will be very useful to analyze about the health of the person. But without wearable sensors, if we use non-wearable sensors, what I'm explaining here, we can actually analyze from the sensor data about the person's activity. And of course, there can be some approximation in that calculation. So here you see the sensors are fitted with different appliances, whether it's a bed, whether it's a chair, sofa, or the sewing machine, a heater, microwave oven, hot water kettle, and so on. And you can see here the Jigbee coordinator, which is used with the laptop, which is used as the data collector. And then data is stored and data analyzed almost on real time. The fundamental building block here is the sensors and the technology for transmitting the data. So the raw data with a real time stamp are collected by the system and you store the data. Of course, the data will be also used for future, but on real time, you actually analyze to determine what type of activity. And then you define as how well the person is. So wellness of the person, that means you can say person is living a wealthy life or not in terms of his daily activities. So a lot of computational aspect is required here because as I said before, raw data sometimes doesn't give much information unless we process it. So processing is very important and that's why different types of computational tool is very, very useful. So we have to use to annotate the activities. We use some data centric approach, probabilistic approach. Also we use time series analysis and we use called pattern matching activities. So if few activities happen at the same time, what type of activity the person is doing. So the basic idea here is to tell about the behavior of the persons, how well the person is leading his life. 
one of the important question here is that how do you decide what type of sensors are required? This is an important question because human beings are different. So that's the subjective questions. And we, what we want to say here is that it's not same answer for everyone. It depends on the lifestyle. So what we could do here is that we decide certain number of sensors, we install them, and then after a few weeks, we use the mathematical tool called frequency of usage. If some sensors are not used significantly high, then we may ignore that sensors in that particular setup. So that way you can decide what are the sensors are useful for that particular person. So once you have the sensor installed, then you can collect the data for analysis of the data and you define wellness. There are two types of wellness. One, one type of wellness we call based on wellness function one based on inactive usage. So inactive usage means there is a time when no sensor is used for the person's day-to-day -day life. How much that time can be so that the person can be considered still healthy. Another important consideration for the wellness function two is called overusage. So overusage means some of the activity are happening more than expected. And most important is the, the sleeping time. So many, many incident happen, the person is sleeping on the bed and then something happened. So that was the another important consideration here. And we considered that everything should be normal if it is close to one and that factor goes down. And if it comes to below 0.6 or 0.5, then we may consider that something is going to be not normal. So then we generate the warning message. The data what we collect, those data if we analyze with the help of Fourier series, uh, time series, then we can actually predict the future activity of the persons. So we can use last eight weeks of data and we can take tell that what is going to happen on week nine. And this is very important because as we know that person's activity a person's habit will change with time. So the main thing what we have considered as regular may not be regular after a certain time. So then how do you know the regular activity? So that's why this forecast is very important that can be considered as the regular activity. So that's we could do from the last eight weeks of data. And some of the forecast here, as you can see, they are very close to the actual. So the person's habit, personal lifestyle, how it is changing, what are the trend, we actually can talk about it from this time series analysis. Another important thing is that we can track the persons. And this is done with the help of PIR sensor, passive infrared sensor. If you have installed too many passive infrared sensor in the house, it's possible that with the help of those sensors, we may be able to tell where the person is located. And this is sometimes important because last 15, 20 years, there was extensive research on fall detection. How do you know a person's at home fallen down? How quickly you can determine that? So without using any kind of wearable sensors on the person's body, we can actually track the persons. So this is very, very important aspect of this research. So I'll talk a little bit about our current research activities, what we do. So here we develop different types of sensors fabricating from the design to fabrications. And our research is mainly concentrated called interdigital sensor. 
we use the technology called MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. In recent times, we are also using different flexible material to fabricate sensor. This sensor work as a capacitive sensor and use the electric field. So if you think of the capacitive sensor, electric field from positive plate to negative plate, but of course we are not working with direct current, we are working with alternating current. So that means this positive and negative, they are instantaneous. So they will produce electric field. Electric field will pass through the material within the capacitor and they will change. What we do here, we measure the impedance. We call electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Once we measure the impedance, we can measure the capacitance and resistance. So this sensor can be used as a resistive sensors, but predominantly it's a capacitive sensor. So here, what you see is the MEMS-based fabrications. In this four inch wafer, we can get almost like 20, 22 sensors. And as you can see this picture, it's coming in the micrometer. So it's not very large. The spacing between the two electrode is around 50 micrometer and the size is 2.5 millimeter by 2.5 millimeter. So it's 2.5 millimeter by 2.5 millimeter. And that's the sensing area. And that's the electrode where you connect for external circuit. So this is the electric field, what you see here, we call material under test, MUT. And here, what we are showing is that by changing the spacing between the two electrodes, you can actually make the resolutions better. Another important thing what we do for chemical and biological applications, there are many things which can affect your result. So if you want to determine a particular things, for example, if you want to determine fat content in meat, or if you want to determine protein, in blood, or if you want to determine nitrate in water, how do you make the sensor selective? So that's what, when my students, they do PhD in on sensor related applications, sensor related research, they try to develop a coating, which is called molecular imprinted polymer. So they develop a polymer, which can detect in the molecular level. So for example, a cancerous cell, so these are the research the student do. And this polymer has got different advantage. One of the main advantage is the storage. You don't need an environment where it should be controlled. So that's the big advantage. This molecular, the, uh, molecular imprinted polymer preparation takes almost 48 hours. There are different steps which you need to follow. Uh, so I'm not going into the detail of that. And application wise, this is one of the applications where we can detect the bacteria, especially E. coli bacteria in meat. So that's the research one of my earlier students have done. And then another applications here where we can detect the contaminations from plastic bottle. So called DEHP, diethyl hexyl phthalate coming from the plastic bottle and leached in water. So we can detect that type of application. So here, very, very useful for health consideration. Another recent applications, one of my students has done called early detection of the bone loss, osteoporosis. So the bone loss is problem for many, many people. Like in Australia, even out of 26 million people, around 4.1 million people are suffering from osteoporosis. So that's the big problem. In India, 90 million people are suffering from osteoporosis. Most of the time, people break their bone, they go to the doc doctor, and then it takes long time to even diagnose with the problem. Unless you diagnose, you cannot actually start the medicine. So that's the big problem. And this can help a lot because we can detect very early stage. So that's some result. And the sensor, what we have developed, we can upload the data in the internet so that you can actually doctor don't need to, don't need to go to the, you don't need to go to the doctor, but doctor will get the result from the, 
from the sensor data uploading in the cloud because of internet of things applications. So one of our dream here is that if you can make the sensors, that type of applications, and you have got few sensor as a sensor array, then it is possible that it can detect from urine, not from blood. So that's one of the applications we are looking into to make the sensor for that. Here, of course, the sensor need to be very robust and that's why it's very challenging, but we are working on that. In recent times, our students started working on the flexible material. There are many advantages compared to MIMS. Most important advantage is that in the university infrastructure, you do not need a very high performance MIMS laboratory. With very cheap system, it is possible the students can fabricate the flexible sensor. You basically need a laser system. So these flexible sensor are also interdigital type, but it's a flexible material, so you can bend it. You can use it on the, the wearable clothes. You can put it without much problem on the human body. And it can measure any kind of bending, any kind of stress, strain, so on. And as you can see, with the change of the dimensions, the capacitor of the sensor is the capacitive sensor. The capacitor will change, which will be measured and the properties of the material will be determined. So that's what we do. So here, what we do, we use different types of material called PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane, PET, polyethylene tetrathalate, or polyamide film. They are used as the base material. Along with the base material, we use different types of electrode material, which is carbon nanotube or graphene, or aluminum. So that you have to take care while you design. And then when you fabricate, you have to follow slightly different procedure depending on what material you are using. Now each one has got its own advantage and disadvantage. So the selection of the material is very important. Some of the material you may not be used for health related applications or if you think of the sensor will be implanted sensor used inside the body because it should not be toxic or it should not be being some bringing some health effect so that's the important thing so we have developed last 3 4 years different types of sensors for many different applications healthcare related applications or industrial applications environmental applications. So we have dif uh, developed different types of sensors using different materials. One of the problem here that those sensors are not very large in size. So they are like few tens of millimeters by few tens of millimeters. But if you think of sensor, which is very large simulating human skin, one of the problem what we face is that we need to have many sensors. So right now we are trying to develop large electronic skin, simulating the human skin. And we want to develop the sensor with high sensitivity as well as resolution. Like if you think of human skin, whether a mosquito bite you or somebody press a needle or somebody hold your hands, we can feel it properly where it is, how much force, what type of force and so on. So we are trying to mimicking that type of detection ability using large sensor. That's what we are working on. One of my students is working on that area. So I'll be now talking of another project which is going on is called smart city applications. We have developed IoT enabled node for people counting as well as ambient monitoring. So there are many ways you can actually count people. Either you use camera or you can use RFID tag or Wi-Fi reader because everybody has got phone, so Wi-Fi reader, or of course you can use people. Now one of the application wise, we had some requirement 
as we all know that for any technological system, we like to have it very cheap, low cost, but low cost is not everything. It also consumes very low power and it should be able to detect. And then of course, you should not divulge the identity. So those are the different requirements. And interestingly, you will find that pyroelectric sensor, PIR sensor, they fits the bill. So we used PIR sensor for that type of applications. There are many cities right now, this smart city applications happen. This pedestrian monitoring, people monitoring. So in Australia, we have in Melbourne and Liverpool, along with our system. In New Zealand, in Auckland, in USA, New York, in Ireland, in Dublin, Spain, Barcelona. And you see, many of them use camera. And also many of them use either 3G or 4G systems. What we have used here is called LoRa. LoRa one is called long range wide area network. If you see LoRa, it is very similar like Zigbee or Wi-Fi, but it consumes very low power and provides long range. Theoretically, it range goes to almost 50 kilometer, but I would say after two, three kilometer, what we have seen in our experience last two years, it don't give you more than two kilometer, but up to two kilometer is quite good. So you need to have some gateway. So here, our developed system, we monitor people as well as some ambient parameters. While we monitor people, our system is installed on the electric pole. And here we have made in such a way that we will not be counting any pet. So sometimes you have seen people walk with their dogs, with their pets. So you do not want to monitor, we do not want to count the pet. So we have adjusted the focal length in such a way that detecting ability is kind of restricted. So that's the way we have done, and it gives quite interesting result. The PIR sensor is used because it has got quite a few advantage. It's low cost, power consumption is very low. Most important advantage is that it does not intrude the privacy. And it works on the principle of movement as well as body heat. So that's what we have used PIR sensor for these applications. As we know, the camera is in many places, camera is used, but here in Australia, privacy is one of the main consideration. So we did not use camera for that. And we have an environmental combo where we can get many parameters such as temperature, humidity, pressure, carbon dioxide, total volatile organic compound. So that's very good. And this combo provides you I2C interface for easy connecting to the microcontroller. So that's the whole idea of whole electronics, what you actually need here. You need Arduino, PIR sensor, combo, then of course, everything based on solar panel. We have rechargeable battery inside. We use 6,000 milliampere hour battery. That battery has been selected in such a way that if you do not have sunlight for a week, your system will still work. But of course we have solar panel, which is six volt, six watt, sufficient to charge the battery as well as provide the power for normal operation. We have also need to use antenna for the transmitting the data. So that's the electrical connection diagram of the system. And we have developed some algorithm it's not exactly machine learning, but close to machine learning type of algorithm. In order to avoid the measurement error of the PIR sensor. So PIR sensor gives us digital signal. Now, if one person enters in the focus length and by the time the digital signal comes from high to low, if another person enters, then the digital high pulse extended. 
And of course, that does not tell you only one person, that is multiple persons. So how can you take into account the speed of walking along with this high signal to calculate multiple people? So that's what we have done a little bit of machine learning here. And that gives us very good accuracy of count. Also, we have calculated how much is the battery consumption. So taking into account, we measure continuously, but we transmit only every 10 minutes. And we can say that it will give us around four days of backup with 3.7 volt, 6,000 milliamp per hour battery. Ideally, you should get like that, but because of the solar panel, you will have no interruptions of operation. So that's the fabricated system for experimental purpose. This node gives us the directional ability. We can actually tell whether the person going from left to right or right to left. And that's the installation to get the result. So we have installed not exactly this type of system, some modified systems in the many place, around 70 nodes we have installed around our university area, which is working for last two years. There are some issues though, due to Corona, maintenance has not been done properly. So this is our architecture of the whole system. So we have the sensor node and every sensor node has got the LoRa and the LoRa connected to the gateway. So there are many gateways around our universities. In fact, in Sydney, the IoT gateway, LoRa gateway is quite common now. And we use the network called TTN network, the things network not the thing speak. And we upload the data to cloud. And after that, we use the data for different applications. So we have developed some apps here to visualize the data. So the node which we have done modified is like this. The, this is the box. So this is the node and this is the solar panel. You can see here. Here, this is the solar panel, this is the node. So around our university area, outside university area, we have many nodes. So this first node which we done, it was by 3D printing, but that takes quite long time. So we had to modify it to make our purpose. So these are the different result what we have got. We have developed machine learning to make the error very, very small. So as you can see, we get almost 99% accurate for the people count with the help of modifications of the calibration as well as the some algorithm development of taking into account for the long pulse. And these are the different result of different parameters coming out from the, from the combo sensor. So you can see here, we can tell about the direction of movement as well as number of people. We can talk about the temperature. We can talk about the humidity, or pressure, air pressure, carbon dioxide, or total volatile organic compound. So the combo sensor can give you quite a bit of different result, which are very, very handy for monitoring. Now what we are trying to do is to relate that with the different other parameters. So we have, I'm not presenting here, we are still in the process. What we have seen that this result with respect to people's count before COVID and after COVID, there is a significant relationship of this monitoring. So which we'll be presenting later on, not today, because we're still in the process of calculations. Of course, we are trying also to make this happen in the in the different WhatsApp applications in the in the apps. So in these apps, you can see in the in the phone different parameters, and also we can tell about different nodes and how many people is in the close by. So those are the different information you can get. So I'll finish with the last application, which is implanted sensor. Implanted sensor, basically the whole idea is to use inside the body to address the lower back pain problem. Many people 
are suffering from lower back pain, they go for operations and there are many issues. So this one student is working with the doctor and we try to develop sensors which will be implanted in the spine to know different stress, strain, and other parameters. So when the doctor does operations, of course, they use call that interbody cage, which actually makes the, the problem area L4, L5 immovable. And they do that with the help of some interbody cage, either from titanium or different other material with the help of screw. But once the operation happen, many things can happen. The screw can become loose. They can come out. The material may not fit well with the persons and they, the, the bone and the muscle, they may not properly adjust with the system. So many problems can happen. So we are trying to, trying to address some of the issues. And most important thing is that how can you make the structure of the interbody cage so that you actually have the proper shape before the operations? So that's what we are going to do. And whole idea will be you can continuously monitor the strain and other things. This will help the doctor to get very good idea about the process. Right now, there is no such things available. Only thing doctor can do is to operate once more and to open it and to see. So the student has developed some simulations with different types of material, different shapes, and to see how the, which one is actually able to take more strain and what type of strain happened. So that's the simulation result at this stage. So, and the student has developed the sensors. This sensor is very small. It's like 2.5 millimeter by five millimeter. So again, interdigital sensors. And we are looking into whether we will go for the capacity measurement or registry measurement. So as you can see here, the capacity measurement is giving very dis distinctive result with the strain, whereas registry measurement, they are only a little bit difference at low frequency, but at relatively high frequency, you do not see any kind of difference. So we are now in the process of making the sensor we have developed, we are making the interfacing circuits, and also we are looking into the energy aspect, whether the energy, the power which is required for the operation of the sensor will be provided from outside source or what are the mode by which you can do that. So those are the things we are now looking into. This is of course, it's a very challenging project and we do not think that we'll be able to make the in vivo study soon, but of course there are lots of experiment need to be conducted uh, before it goes for human trial. So I'll be finishing here and I'll be very happy to take the questions. So basically, what we do, we try to develop different types of sensors for different applications. And we make the sensors, IoT enabled sensors so that you can see the data in the cloud. And our big picture is to make those sensors for human wellness, especially in an environment where you can think of smart home, which provides environment where people can live independently. The system has been such that you can develop new sensors and which can be connected to the system without much difficulty. More and more, we see the new sensors are coming for human applications. So monitoring the human health with different new sensors is the new research, which is finding many applications. And in this domain, IoT provides a huge potential for that. And also with the IoT smart city that will be coming more and more. Already we can see lots of new applications are coming up. How do you actually use the infrastructure more efficiently? So there will be no more new, uh, new applications in that area. So with that, I will stop here and uh, I will take questions now. Please feel free.
to ask whatever you have in your mind. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, uh, may I now request the participants to kindly interact with the professor to clarify the various doubts. So participants can raise their hand or type their questions in the chat box. May I read out the uh, question that was directly posted to me, sir? So one of the participants directly posted a question to me. May I read out that question, sir? Yeah, proceed, I can see in the chat, is it? Uh, yes, what yes, is sir. directly posted yes. to me, sir? One of the participants directly posted uh, to me, which is not seen in the in your chat box. Uh, I will read out the question for you, sir. Uh, I can also see some questions in the yes, in the thing. Yes, I okay. So plus, uh, first you tell what you know, then I will go yes, through sir. one by one. Yeah. Sure, sir. So, which sensor is used to read the sound emitted by human body and transmit it to the PC? I repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, I got the question. Yeah, so we we do not have any specific sensor, but what we have the flexible sensors, which we actually, we actually measure, measure. We we have measured the breathing rate. We have measured the breathing rate. So when the when the lungs you know pushes uh, the uh, air, so that change is reflected in the change of the dimensions of the sensor using our flexible sensor. And we can use that to monitor the breathing rate of the person. Okay, so. May I read out the other questions for you, sir? Yes. So what is the accuracy of intelligent systems that we have achieved as on today and also, what about the complexity of the system? May I repeat I, the question? I would sir? like it more specific. So when you say accuracy of intelligent system, that does not make much sense. So you can say that accuracy of sensor. So what happened when you make any sensor, you need to calibrate the sensor with some standard. And you know that what is the accuracy of the of your sensor. So if the sensor does not provide much accuracy close to the standard, of course, you can do some kind of processing there with the help of circuit. So the sensor gives some signal, which is either resistance or capacitance in our case. So you can draw the calibration curve to make the sensor accurate. But what will happen? You may not have the this accuracy for the whole range. So you may need to split it into different range. Now, in order to think of the complexity, of course, there are lots of complexity involved. In any research, the complexity is there. Nothing is simple, nothing is straightforward. So you need to go through that and you need to see what are the problems you face. So for example, if you think of that any sensors, they are influenced by environmental parameters. So for example, you, you think of that temperature is changing, how the temperatures affect your system. So you may have to make the temperature compensating circuit. So those are the part of the research. Once you do, you will come across different things and you have to address those things. May I read out the next question, sir? Yeah, I can read one like yeah, sure, sir. Yes. detection sensor is currently available. Unfortunately, the sensor what we are talk we had I described is not available. The reason is if you if you look into the sensor research, especially in the medical domain, nothing comes very easily because you have to go through different types of clinical trial, which takes long time we are seeing the miracle that COVID-19 vaccine is coming up so quickly. And this, the reason is that because the whole world is affected and it killed more than 200, 2 million people. Otherwise, any kind of medicine, any kind of sensors related to health, they takes few years to 10 years of research and different clinical trial. So that's the issue. We cannot get anything very, very quickly.
is there some sensor which can sense and measure lumps in human body? Uh, I don't think what you have asked properly. See, one most important thing is the visual sensor. Visual sensor means using our eyes. So people try to mimic it with the help of camera, but the visual inspection is one of the main things. So if you think of the lump inside human body, then of course uh, you need to go for MRI and uh, other types of scanning system. Uh, otherwise you cannot do, but the problem is person doesn't know before it actually happened in a big way. So that's one of the problem what we are trying to address for osteoporosis is that if we can measure using the blood or urine, we can actually determine the specific problem at the early stage. Zigbee has been replaced by new technologies. Can you let us know in IoT tech? So yeah, Zigbee has not been very popular in recent times. Now, more and more, depending on the applications where you want long range and low data, LoRa is used. If you want more range, if you want relatively low, short range and high data, you can use Wi-Fi. So LoRa is becoming more and more popular in environmental applications where you do not need too much data. Of course, there are other types of communications depending on the applications. So if cost is not a factor, you can go for you know, 4G you know, or 5G related applications with different transmitter. But if your cost is the issue, then LoRa is the best. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. So just one a small question is there, sir, in the chat box. Uh, for capturing images, which kind of sensors are available? I mean, sir, one of the participants is asking, sir. For capturing images, uh, uh, I mean, we 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 use PIR sensor that is not for image, but if we use image, there is no option other than using camera. So. Of course, different types of camera you can have. Uh, some camera may be very cheap camera and the range may be restricted. Also image quality can be issue. Uh, but if you deal with the image, you have to use camera. There is no option other than camera. I'm trying to see whether any more new questions is there. And just one more question has come, sir. Yeah. How do we decide sensor appropriateness and cost effectiveness for any application? So that's the trade off you have to make. It depends on what type of applications. So, you know, some applications, for example, military application where cost is not the issue. But if you have some applications where cost is you know the the most important factor then you have to compromise so sometimes if you know your you no know, applications that will help you whether you can go for very high performance systems or not so it's a, it's not a right answer because you don't know exactly what your application is but if your application is known and your cost is known that how much so for example, our smart city node, each one will be around 400 Australian dollar. So which means around 20,000 Indian rupees. Now, you may say that how we can have that much because most of the components we buy outside. And if you do not have you know, cheap system, cheap cost in Australia, one of the problem is that we do not have any manufacturing uh, in the semiconductor area. So we have to rely on outside. So everything is like expensive, but electronics, one of the positive things of electronics is that they are 
becoming cheaper with time so it's possible that you can make the hardware cheap with time so there will be development cost for the software but the component cost will be less so any, any other questions from the participants please So one last question, sir. Uh, what's the role of IoT in future? What are the areas need to be concentrated? Just one last question, sir. This one. Yeah. IoT will be extensively used and will be very, very part of our life in future. Is already in many, many, many countries and many cities. We see different applications of IoT, and with time more and more applications will be coming in our life. So IoT is not going away. In fact, it will be much more blended in our life. So it's, it's, it's good that we, we should be open-minded to see what are the different applications. But at the end of the day, what is important is that what is required to make IoT enable systems. We need uninterrupted internet availability everywhere so that we can use IoT as a part of our life. That's the most important thing. Uh, uh, sorry to ask you again, sir. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, two, two more questions are just raised out in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, I can see one, which is a uh, few example mobile sensor available for use, like if you want to detect human presence at a disaster hit area. Yeah, so um, one of my student work in that type of area where you can use some kind of you know, sensor operating at high frequency, either microwave or millimeter wave, where it's a big antenna transmitting the electromagnetic signal and you can get back the reflected signal and analyze. And if there is any persons, then you can get the change of signal very, very predominantly you can tell. So that type of applications are there, but unfortunately the sensor size is not very small uh, because it's operate in the very high frequency. So microwave frequency means 300 megahertz to 30 gigahertz. So that type of application. So it's operate at very high frequency. And they're not, they're not cheap though. And difference between power and smart grid, difference between power and smart grid. So if you want to say, what is the difference between normal ten, high tension line and the smart grid? So high tension line is normal power transmitting line, but when you say smart grid means you are using ICT. ICT means different types of sensors and uh, smart uh, processing circuits and smart control so that you are monitoring the many parameters to make the grid operate in an efficient manner. So that's the smart grid, that applications of ICT in the power transmitter lines to make the power transfer or power you know, is, is efficient. So you are monitoring all the parameters continuously and you are taking the decision. You no, know? So that's the basically smart grid, what we talk about. Yeah, yes, sir. And th thank you very much, sir. So uh, at the outset, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Subhash Chandra Mukhopadhyay for the kind enough uh, uh, to accept our invitations and uh, delivering his uh, uh, presentations or the outcomes of the research, what he's been doing for the past. And uh, most likely, the, uh, I hope the participants have benefited a lot. So uh, thank you once again, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, Srinivas, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, please complete the poll so that I can discuss oh. with the participants. Uh, sir, I will uh, will launch it in five minutes, sir. Uh, uh, please give me five minutes, sir. I will launch oh, it in five minutes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, sir now our uh, let us wind up the session, sir. Uh, sure. Thank you, sir. I will contact you in the latest days. Okay, so thank you, Nagender, and hope you. that your rest of the program goes well. And thank you, sir. Thank we'll you. Thank contact you. some other time. Thank you. Okay, so, I'll, I'll I'll go out from here. Okay. 
yeah, yes sir just uh, some small announcements are there for the participants sir, regarding the workshop program so i will just make that one and complete the session uh, uh, just as a few announcements for the participants place regarding the attendance uh, some of you have posted that you did not attend uh, you are not clear about the attendance posted in today's uh, whatsapp group and the uh, gmail so uh, may uh, so basically uh, we would like to ensure that your attendance is properly marked so that is the format uh, which the atal portal is asking us to submit the attendance so we have used the same format and we have just shared with you uh, what the attendance status Yes, some of them uh, names were not matched uh, because the names in the Zoom meeting and the registered names in the portal, there is a mismatch in that. So to make sure that they are properly been uh, considered, so uh, please do send your uh, your registered email ID. Please send your registered email ID and your name, what you registered in the ATEL program, so that we can cross verify it and we will try to uh, modify your attendances and. So that we can upload it by tomorrow. So tomorrow is the last day for our uh, program. So the attendance has to be uploaded on the Atel portal. So that's why uh, today we have uh, shared with you all. So yeah. uh, all the uh, registered participants, please make sure your attendance is correct. So maybe some of them are not registered, but still attending the program. That is okay. That's fine. But for registered participants, uh, because there is also an online test. So you know the requirements. There must be 80% of attendance and as well as 60% of marks should be scored in the online test. So your 80% of attendance is one of the criteria. So please make sure that your attendance is uh, uh, properly marked uh, in the sheets what we have given to you. So if there is any uh, uh, any conflict, please let us know So by today evening so that we'll update it by tomorrow morning and we'll get back to you. Sir, may I add, uh, may I add one point at this context, sir? Yes, please. please so go ahead, many, uh, some requests have come uh, to you as well as to me personally also. Uh, the reason is actually uh, participants are requested to check the attendance in between the two lines surrounding their name. So actually, uh, whatever attendance we have uh, given basically, so some participants have asked for clarification and all the attendances are correct actually. I replied them in person actually. So uh, one yeah. request is please check the attendance, please check for your attendance uh, in between the two lines. So, uh, like, check the attendance, which... Uh, I'll, go, yes, I'll leave. Eh? Yeah, yes, sir. So, so far, uh, 120 plus are there, sir. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Please, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Eh? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Srinivasa. Yes, so, sir. If, if you see there are around 120 plus are there here at this moment. Yes, sir. Uh, now, these all 120 students, most likely they are going to write the test tomorrow, I think, yes, because I, I have seen the participants list here also. Yes, sir. I think only very few are there who are not registered here. Yes, sir. But, but uh, there are something like uh, Redmi, uh, uh, Redmi and uh, some numbers are there, a couple yes, of sir. numbers. So you please keep track of those things also so that uh, they will not miss the attendance. Uh -huh. Sure, sir. Actually, well, whoever have uh, respond uh, like requested us, I think I have verified the attendance details and uh, uh, the attendance that we have given is correct, sir. I clarified their doubts, sir. Okay. So one request to all the participants, please check for your attendance in between the lines surrounding your name. It's a bit confusing. The format is a bit confusing. So if you see in the laptop or computer, like it would be more clear. So if you have still any questions, uh, you can direct those questions to us. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more one more important announcement for the participants. Tomorrow, uh, we already as per the schedule, there will be an online test. So for that online test, there will be a mock test so that uh, we make sure that the uh, every participant is receiving the question and they are going to submit in a pro in a smooth manner. So today afternoon at around uh, after the uh, uh, two thirty uh, means two thirty to three thirty session. So after three thirty, we will have a mock test just for five to ten minutes to make sure that uh, for the tomorrow test, everything goes on smoothly. So that is, please, uh, all the registered participants, I request you to attend the mock test, and we'll also have the clarification regarding the attendance. So just for 10 minutes uh, is a must, please do attend that particular mock test, as well as uh, tomorrow's online test too. So that is my sincere request to you all. So please make sure that you attend this mock test as well as tomorrow's test, so that our attendance as well as the test marks will be clarified, uh, and there won't be any discrepancies in the later stage. So that is my sincere request. Please do inform to your colleagues if you are there in contact with you. Uh, otherwise, uh, once we submit the uh, everything, then again, we cannot revoke it. 
So that little portal does not allow us to revoke your, either to re-enter your marks or to re-enter your uh, attendances. So that will be very difficult for us also as well as for you. So we don't want to make any uh, problems in the later stage. Everything should be resolved by tomorrow morning. So my sincere request to you all, please do attend the mock test as well as the tomorrow's final test and complete the process, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your cooperation. And yeah, yeah. if you have any doubts, please do let us know. Of course, the next session will start at 12, uh, 12 noon. Uh, the slides related to that session has been uh, already passed on to you. And I will request uh, Professor Subhash also to share his slides so that he may be having some reference in the later stage. Yeah. So uh, almost all uh, slides have been, yeah, mock test time. Yeah, 3.30 to 3.40, ma'am. I will send the mail and as well as I will send the WhatsApp message also. Yeah, any other doubts, please? So if you, uh, anybody is having any notes, you please can you can interact with me and we'll uh, see that the things will complete smoothly. Of course, internet issues are there uh, as well at our place. Uh, so just uh, only a, a couple of times there are minor issues. Please bear with us. Yeah. Sir, uh, I, uh, a small request to the participants. I will launch the poll for this session along with the poll for other session, second session, next session, sir. So there is a small difficulty and uh, I will, uh, is it okay, sir? I did not get to see no, sir. May I launch the feedback for this session after a while, sir, along with the second uh, next session, sir. Uh, okay, okay. Then along with the second session, you complete it. Yeah, sure, sir, sure. Okay, sir. So the, this session's poll will be taken in the next session, please. Sir, actually, uh, there are some messages in the chat box also. Yes, it's a bit confusing. There's a format uh, that is uh, attendance report format. Uh, that's there in the atal portal the same thing we have adopted so as mentioned uh, please uh, check for your attendance in between the two lines surrounding your names okay then i, I just Thank open you. the sheet now from my screen yes, you sir. Know, or you can open your screen and show sure sir i will i will share the screen sir yeah I will share you share screen. your screen and uh, open sure sir and i will do that sir. yeah please share your screen yeah, that will be fine So participants are requested to uh, check for your attendance uh, uh, in between these two lines, basically. So most, most of the participants are getting confused with that. I think uh, this they are taking as uh, absent, basically. So please uh, check for your attendance in between these lines, basically. So attendance is marked above the label. So that is the format that is given. So above the label, basically. So here it is marked as present, whereas some participants are getting confused. So this is given as present, but uh, they are interpreting this with this absent actually. So please keep this in mind. If you have still any uh, questions or doubts, uh, feel free to uh, ping us so that we will try to clarify your doubts. Thank you. So is it okay, sir, Naginder, sir? Yeah, Srinivasa. Yes, sir. That is a format that is taken, uh, that is given uh, in the portal, and we are adopting the same uh, uh, yeah. format. Yeah, hope I, I could able to clarify your doubt. Participants. Uh, sir, is it fine, sir? Yeah, yeah, it's, I think it should be okay. Yes, sir. Participants, yeah. Yes, it's a bit confusing, I accept, sir. But that so, is what uh, they asked us, yes, from, yes, sir. us to submit it. Yeah. Sir, I will launch the poll for this session along with the next session, sir. Yeah, sir yeah. As I mentioned. Okay, thank so, you, sir. So the, I request the participants to join for the session at 12 noon, 11.50 a.m. so that we can start our 12 noon session. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll see, see you again at the next session.